Good afternoon. Um, my name is Abraham Kim. I'm the Vice President for the Korea Economic Institute. Uh, we're really thrilled to have you here in, in our three-part series. This is our third seminar, uh, recognizing some of the emerging voices in the, uh, in the Korea policy field. Um, as many of you know, um, KEI has been in the long, has been long time doing a lot of programs trying to promote and train leaders for the future. And this is uh, just another program in, in, in promoting uh, future scholarship in Korean studies. Uh, we are thrilled today uh, to uh, bring up three very uh, talented uh, students uh, as well as um, scholars in training uh, to present to you uh, three important papers that we selected. Uh, just a little bit of context uh, for this program. Um, earlier this summer, we had uh, sent a, an email and contacted all of our professors uh, that we know across the United States asking for your best papers uh, from your, either from your graduate students, PhD students, or even talented undergraduates. And we had met, received tremendous response and from that group of uh, students that we received, papers that we received, we selected 10. And in the last two weeks, we presented seven of these uh, very talented students and today you will uh, see and listen to the remaining three. Um, today, uh, these students have been recommended by three prominent professors, um, Kent Calder from Sice Johns Hopkins University, uh, Professor William Grimes from Boston University, and Professor David Steinberg from Georgetown. And we're really privileged to have David here in the audience uh, to support a student. <laughs> um, I'm going to be inviting uh, each of these students to come up and present for about 10 to 15 minutes their paper. And then uh, we will have Scott Snyder, Director for the Center for U.S.-Korea Policy at the Asia Foundation, uh, to provide some comments and commentary on the papers. Uh, briefly, I'd like to introduce you each of these uh, students. First, we're going to have June Park. She's a PhD student in political science from Boston University, and she just arrived from Japan, so she's a little jet lag, I'm sure, uh, but we're very honored to have her here. And she'll be uh, presenting a paper on capital control, and she'll, and we'll, uh, she'll be giving a, a great presentation on that. Uh, next, we'll have Unjung Lim. Uh, she's a PhD student uh, in international relations from SICE Johns Hopkins, and she'll be talking about uh, uh, Korea, Japan, and, uh, and the coal industry. And then finally, Lisa Ha. Uh, she is a graduate from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown, um, and she'll be uh, presenting a paper on uh, so South Korea's investment in uh, nuclear technology in Southeast Asia. Uh, we look forward to a great session and we hope you can um, muster up a lot of questions and ask them during the Q&A session. So with this, I'm going to first uh, ask June Park to come up and to present uh, her paper. Thanks. My name is June Park and I am a PhD candidate in political science at Boston University. I'm currently conducting my PhD dissertation research at the Ministry of Finance in Japan. Uh, today I will deliver a very short policy paper regarding the recent capital controls deployed by the Korean government. I hope you will enjoy it. Um, the title is Car From Cardinal Sin to Policy Agenda, the Role of Capital Controls in Emerging Market Economies, including Korea, of course, and this is a brief study of the Korean case. So for introduction, I will briefly go over the capital inflows in emerging market economies, explain a little bit about the history of capital controls, and kind of go over what Korea experienced during the crises, uh, the Asian financial crisis and the global financial crisis. And in the second section, I explain the Korean unparalleled experience um, in response to foreign pressures for opening up, which is the financial liberalization in the 1990s and the responses from the Korean government in two of these financial crises. And in the third section, I explain Korea's launch of capital controls, the recent one and the 2004 one, um, the move for capital controls per se, and the 2004 limitation of NDFs, also the 2011 macroprudential levy. 
And I will conclude with a summary and some policy recommendations. So the increase of capital inflows in uh, emerging market economies, we've seen a lot of upsurge of inflows into emerging market economies. Um, capital inflows into these economies are there for a reason because of low interest rates in the United States, quantitative easing, and quick returns which can be earned in emerging market economies. There are country-specific factors to this, but there are pluses and minuses. There are plus factors for developing nations, which are attractive, fi attractive financing for investment, diversity, diversifying risks, promoting intertemporal trade, and developing financial markets. Whereas there are minus factors as well, which are high demand for local currency, currency appreciation, causing bubbles in assets, housing, stock markets, and etc. The capital controls per se, for definition, I'm just laying out uh, a brief definition here, measures by a government, central bank, or other regulatory body to limit the flow of foreign capital inside, inwards, or outwards of the domestic economy, which are taxes, tariffs, levy, outright legislation, volume re restrictions, and also market-based forces. So to briefly lay out the history of capital controls, I give you the following. Capital controls were introduced in the 1920s and were strengthened in response to the Great Depression in 1929. It was a permanent feature of the international monetary system during the Bretton Woods system, but then Keynesianism was displa displaced during the transitional period. Ultimately, abolishment of capital controls uh, brought about the name cardinal sin attached to the capital controls measures. But then, advocation of capital controls were resurfaced in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. So the mainstream view that capital controls are bad was challenged during the Asian financial crisis because of the following reasons. East Asian countries had yet to develop a financial and capital system with sufficient prudential safeguards. Plus, the double mismatch of maturity and currency made them vulnerable to capital inadequacy and currency depreciation. Also, previous capital inflows, foreign capital inflows, would exit the country very rapidly, which is called hot money. And so, um, in response to what we have experienced in the Asian financial crisis and also the current crisis, the IMF reversed its position on capital controls. And these positions are displayed or demonstrated in the following examples, these articles that were published by the IMF. Korea's unparalleled experience, uh, I give a brief introduction of the financial liberalization in the 1990s. Um, Korea had to open in response to foreign pressures. First in the 1980s, Korea experienced rapid economic growth in the presence of capital controls. Whether or not, whether this was helpful for the Korean economic stability or not, it's currently very debatable. Uh, in the late 1980s, policymaking for liberalization process began in the face of U.S. macroeconomic policies and also pressures on Korea for improved market access for U.S. financial service providers. And in 1994, foreign exchange system reform plan was unveiled under foreign pressures for further financial regulation, regulation in Korea. Uh, between 1995 and 1999, there were a series of multi-year financial sector policy plans uh, promulgated with Korea's 1996 accession to the w uh, OECD. So again, opening in response to foreign pressures, these are some of the standby arrangements by the IMF, a section on Korea's capital account liberalization, um, which were imposed on Korea in the aftermath of the Asian financial crisis. Basically, this table that I give you um, explains how much percentage of shares of foreign ownership was increased and also how much uh, foreigners were able to purchase more in terms of equities in domestic banks. And the move for capital controls, um, the, uh, the from this section it's going to be a more specific uh, policy oriented explanation. The, the consensus reached at home and abroad upon uh, sudden capital outflows in late 2008 um, 
this is a graph that demonstrates how much capital inflows and outflows could actually damage the Korean economy. If you look over here, um, so we start from 1995, 1997 and 8. These changes are a little bit mediocre compared to uh, the current crisis developments. We see a huge <coughs> upsurge of um, we, hu we see a huge upsurge of capital inflows, but then outflows suddenly. And this perhaps the next graph would be a little bit more um, explicit to you. So we see the inflows period here just before the crisis, and a sudden outflow and another inflow period just after the recovery of the crisis and then ag again an another series of outflows then inflows <coughs> and in order to prevent these volatility of capital inflows and outflows the Korean government um, deployed in limitation of non-deliverable forwards markets in 2004 Non-deliverable forwards markets is a short-term cash-settled currency forward between two count count counterparts. On the contracted settle da settlement date, the product <coughs> profit or loss is adjusted between the two counterparties based on the difference between the contracted NDF rate and the prevailing spot at foreign exchange rates on an agreed notional amount. So in 2004, the South Korean Ministry of Finance and Economics which is now the Strategy and Finance Ministry, introduced new regulations aimed at limiting activity in the NDF market on on of onshore banks. This move is aimed at reducing the volatility in the Korean won exchange rates with other currencies. And I will now explain the macroprudential levy that was deployed uh, in recent days. The partial amendment law to the Foreign Exchange Transaction Act was passed in the National Assembly in April, early April, and went into force th earlier this month. And ceilings on foreign exchange derivatives positions of all banks, there was a limit at 50% fixed of their equity uh, capital. Also, regulations on foreign currency bank loans allowed for purchase of raw materials, uh, foreign direct investment, repayment of debts, but limited use for domestic purposes. Also, prudential regulations, which are highly necessary for improving foreign exchange soundness of financial institutions, there is a 20 basis point levy imposed on uh, overseas debt, maturing in less than one year. And also, there are some new policies that are under consideration, which are additional measures to discourage short-term borrowing from abroad. So to conclude, a brief summary over here. Korea's policy direction and implementation, particularly in the G20 Seoul Summit in 2010, is not a drastic change of policy. It is a step forward for macroprudential stability in the Korean economy in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. The non-deliverable forward, forwards uh, limitation and also macroprudential levy launched by the Korean government are just in line with the global context of de deploying capital controls. However, thus far, the actual effects of capital controls remains to be seen. And lastly, as for policy recommendations, domestic efforts to strengthen financial monitoring and advisory system are strongly required in addition to efforts to control inflows from abroad. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Yun Jung Lim. Um, I'm very glad to be here, and thank you for inviting me to this wonderful opportunity. Uh, actually, my paper is this. Uh, the original draft of this paper uh, was presented at actually four years ago at the uh, 2007 APSA American Political Science Association annual meeting. And at the time, I just um, had some interest in this uh, core industry and the clean core technology. Uh, because uh, many these two, uh, because of many these two reasons. One of one of them is uh, I have been interested in the multilateral cooperation in this Northeast Asia, and I just thought uh, energy can be the driving factor to make the uh, multilateral cooperation in this particular re region as the um, Europe uh, experienced. So uh, when I just um, 
you know, see the um, European history, I just realized that, I mean, the core was the key factor to make the uh, European integration go forward. So I just got some interest in the coal industry. And not so many people just um, guess uh, South Korea or Japan uh, as the um, developed countries. Uh, d people just wondering, you know, how how much how I how dependent these two countries uh, are, and how how dependent these two countries are on the um, core. But uh, actually, uh, these two, both of them, I mean, both South Korea and Japan are very heavily dependent uh, on core, especially for electricity generation. I'm gonna um, make more detailed um, explanation later. So um, that was actually one of my main reasons why I just uh, paid attention to this um, particular resource, I mean core, conventional resource. And the, the other reason is um, I, I still believe, I mean, the partnership between the, these two countries, I mean, South Korea and Japan, would be crucial, I mean, the for the uh, multilateral cooperation uh, in this particular region. But um, whenever uh, we just observe the uh, reality, um, we frequently see the uh, competition between especially between these two countries. So I just want to highlight the uh, competition between the two countries um, so, so that we can just um, re-emphasize the uh, importance of the uh, cooperation uh, within the region. So I guess um, many of you uh, have not read my uh, papers. I'm going to briefly um, summarize my my paper and then just would like to make some policy suggestions later. Uh, so this um, this donut um, this donut graph shows you how how dependent I mean how how big I mean Japan and South Korea in terms of core imports actually 27% um, of the whole entire uh, core import in the world uh, is occupied by Japan and 11% by uh, South Korea so combining these two countries 38% almost more than one third of the core core, um, imported core, uh, were um, consumed by uh, Japan and Korea. And the interestingly, Taiwan is also um, the third um, largest core importer in the world. And others um, include China or United States. Of course, the China is the biggest uh, consumer, core consumer, and the United States is the second. But, uh, you know, they can produce uh, core domestically, so they are not the uh, um, first largest or second largest importer. But still, the China, US, South Korea, and Japan are biggest um, uh, core importers and core consumers in the world. Why, uh, why are we um, so dependent on coal is? Here, I mean, here this table shows you why, um, yeah, why South Korea is so dependent on core. Actually, um, South Korea's categorization, uh, whenever you see the um, South Korean governmental documents, you can see um, the categorization of anth anthracite and bituminous, uh, which, is, um, which is divided by the uh, calorie. So uh, bituminous coal is has um, much higher calorie than the um, anthrac anthracite. Uh, so anthracite, we did have the uh, our own domestic uh, reserves in the Korean Peninsula, but uh, due to its low calorie, we cannot use for the, uh, for example, heavy industry or electricity generation. We only used to uh, use that, uh, burn that for domestic fuel. You know, young time kind of things. When I when I um, was a young, we burned that, but now we don't use uh, anymore. I mean, the full domestic fueling. So our main um, main use or main consumption of coal is um, made by bituminous coal. So this next slide shows you. <coughs> Um, for what kind of purpose coal is p consumed in the South Korea? As I mentioned before, the electricity is the main reason reason now, but it was not. I mean, the in the uh, early period, you know, there's none available data even for the uh, 1960s. But uh, since the uh, 1980s, with the uh, economic development, uh, South Korea just. Um, 
started to consume coal for electricity generation and uh, heavy industry also. Coal can be used for the input factor uh, for um, heavy industry, especially for steel. As you know, I mean steel is one of the key um, export industry of South Korea. So coal um, has been important uh, mainly for uh, steel industry first, and then uh, increasingly it is getting more and more important in the for electricity generation. So as you can see uh, with this table, uh, this uh, graph, I mean bituminous coal consumption grows rapidly. This is um, mostly because of the um, electricity generation. So next slide shows you, this is Japanese, I mean graph, and almost, you know, same, I mean the with the uh, Korean tendency. So in Japan also, I mean they consume the uh, coal as the input factor for the uh, steel industry. The blue line shows you um, the uh, uh, demand for the steel industry. It was quite stable and it was still high. Uh, but the red line shows you um, the dramatic I mean, increase in the uh, uh, coal consumption, especially for electricity generation. <coughs> so in Japan, uh, the next slide shows you, I mean, the imported coal increased a lot. Uh, j in Japan also, they don't um, produce um, domestic coal anymore. So they, they do uh, import um, the from abroad for um, their electricity, electricity generation and the uh, uh, industry, heavy industry. And next show, um, actually Japanese government categorized um, the core a little bit different from uh, Korea. We did, you know, bituminous core and anthracite. But here in Japan, they mainly uh, divide up uh, with the non-cocking and cocking. Cocking, which means can be an uh, input factor for the heavy industry or an uh, input factor for e electricity generation. So, but anyhow, as you can see, um, the imported uh, cocking core um, is, uh, has increased a lot. Again, I mean, uh, to make long story short, I mean, again, it is because of um, electricity generation. So we do share um, similar uh, energy security trilemma. First of all, we do need to develop our economy still. I mean, still our economy is, uh, is, uh, is growing. So we need to support, I mean, our still growing um, economy. But for that, we do need to um, input more and more energy. But in, in uh, neither in Japan and or nor in South Korea, we do not have um, substantial natural resources within the territory. So we do have to import I mean, the from abroad. Uh, and the second, second factor of the uh, trilemma is our oil dependency is so heavy. Even, I mean, even we do use oil for, um, um, for for electricity generations, and especially our dependency on Middle East oil uh, is crucially high. I mean, so our 80 or 90 percent uh, of imported oil from Middle East, both countries, I mean, Japan and Korea. So, but uh, as you can guess, I mean, Middle East is politically very volatile. So we need to diversify the uh, energy resource. Um, so that was, uh, these two were the uh, main reason why we just um, trying to develop nuclear energy or this kind of you know core too, especially after the uh, um, oil shocks in the 1970s. And the recent um, recent reason uh, why oh, we need to um, diversify more. I mean, energy resources is uh, climate change. We need to um, decrease our greenhouse gas emission. So nuclear, in that sense, was has been very attractive because it was almost free. I mean, from the uh, greenhouse gas emission. But coal is coal actually is very attractive. It's really cheap, and the uh, supply will be really stable than the uh, oil because the, the reserve is distributed um, worldwidely. Uh, so coal is cheap and coal is stable, but the thing is that uh, the coal is very dirty, very, very dirty. So the, coal, the only, I mean, the only and the, the biggest uh, disadvantage of coal burning uh, is, um, is 
is that, you know, that is really bad for the uh, air pollution. That is why our clean core technology is getting important, I, I thought. So I just paid attention to the uh, clean core technology uh, four years ago. But at that time, uh, I just interviewed s with some um, government officers too in Korea. But at that time, uh, South Korea did not have many interests in the um, clean core technology or uh, they just did hesitate to invest uh, um, extensively in that area because South Korea tends to take, um, how can I say this, tends to be a uh, risk averse in the uh, technology technology oriented uh, industries. So at the time the officers, they said, you know, we we're not sure how, I mean, the clean core technology market is getting larger in the near future. So we wa we just would like to s wait and see and what happens. So that was the, at the time, you know, what they said. But uh, in Japan, they already, I mean, uh, uh, developed their own clean core technology since the uh, 1980s. So even, I mean, in 2007, uh, when I just wrote this uh, original draft, they just had uh, quite advanced uh, technology uh, in clean core uh, area. So um, this slide just briefly shows you, I mean, the which countries are the biggest exporter to Japan in terms of core. So with this slide, um, I just want to summarize, I mean, the South Korea's clean core technology policies. So w first stage, they, um, f since actually 2006, uh, they were trying to design some um, key technologies and then construction and then just um, extending that. But uh, to make long story short, uh, South Korea used to hesitate uh, develop aggressively I mean clean core technology but now things just changed and um, particularly from this year um, South Korea is trying to develop clean core technology more aggressively than before so um, our first uh, IGCC uh, IGCC is um, integrated gasification uh, combined cycle plant, which is one of the uh, clean core technology, but uh, the reason why IGCC is important is uh, IGCC is mainly for the electricity generation. There are many um, different clean core technologies, but, but among them, IGCC is one of the most important technology for both countries because, as I mentioned, you know, um, both South Korea and Japan are dependent on core because of the uh, electricity generations. So IGCC is, is important. So we do, uh, we are going to have uh, our first uh, IGCC plant soon, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, the news, uh, recent news shows that um, uh, there are some strugglings, but anyhow, the, uh, they are planning to do that. Uh, and uh, Kepco and Ude, Ude is the German company, so they just made up the joint venture company for the uh, IGCC plant, or we just um, made some bilateral MOU with the Mongolia. Uh, as you as you know, and the Mongolia does have the uh, extensive uh, reserve and core reserves, so we can export our technology and we can just um, get some guaranteed, I mean, the supply from them. Or POSCO and the SK Innovation, uh, they are one of the two biggest, I mean, the two largest companies who are trying to um, develop uh, CCT, I mean, the clean core technologies. And um, Japan, as I mentioned, um, they were uh, trying to, they ha have been uh, trying to uh, develop their CCT since the uh, 1980s, but the, the main features of their uh, clean core technology policies is they want to cut edge, I mean, uh, different from, I mean, South Korea's risk averse uh, policy. Japan was, uh, has been trying to cut edge in this area. And they want to export their um, CCT to other developing countries, especially uh, where the core reserves um, exist. So, but the thing is that, so they just ex um, spent a lot of money, I mean, the for developing technologies and exporting it uh, or cooperating with the uh, uh, produ core producing countries. 
But anyhow, um, but uh, in in my paper, I just wrote about that. But there are there are not so many cooperations between these two countries. So I just want to highlight th this kind of tension or competitions uh, between the two between the two main um, main energy consumers in the region. Uh, through emphasizing the competition, I just want to highlight the uh, importance of cooperation uh, between these two countries. And I do think um, this is my last last slide. Uh, but as you can see with this figure. Uh, this map, um, you know, coal reserves are mainly re uh, located in the Asian Pacific area. I just still I do believe, you know, um, coal is quite attractive, unattractive uh, resource to make all the uh, Asian Pacific countries get together. Actually, um, China already, they do have their own uh, IGCC plant in Tianjin, and they are trying to make some cooperation with the United States too. Uh, but there are no, no those kind of multilateral approach in this particular region. But I do, again, I do believe and the core can be an, a driving factor because core is politically um, much more, how can I say, stable or safer than the oil or nuclear and we do have a bunch of coal within our region and we do have our own advanced technologies within this region so I do um, I do would like to I mean suggest I mean cooperation through the coal and the clean coal technology okay thank you for your attention thank you Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for the Korean Economic Institute for hosting this symposium. It is an honor to present my research findings on South Korea's nuclear development in Southeast Asia. Today, I will discuss energy use, particularly in Southeast Asia, and how South Korea has provided the most advanced techniques and expertise in civilian nuclear development to countries like Thailand, Myanmar, also known as Burma, Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam. Energy use in Asia has significantly increased due to the demands to sustain as well as to propel development and growth. This energy demand has grown so fast, causing an increase in gas emission and pollution. And as a result, the expectations for nuclear power are rising in Asia, where alternative energy is scarce and expensive. But has nuclear generating capacity become a desirable option to solve the issue of energy security supply as well as to offset environmental pollution? Now today, South Korea has emerged as energy powers in developing civilian nuclear programs. It has 21 power reactors providing 40% of South Korea's electricity, which is also known as one of the biggest nuclear programs in the world. This power program has led the South to develop a substantial and highly competent scientific and technical infrastructure. President Lee Myung-bak said nuclear power-related re business will be the most profitable market after automobiles, semiconductors, and shipbuilding. We will promote this industry as a major export business. And indeed, South Korea has taken interest in particularly Southeast Asia. Economic interactions between South Korea and Southeast Asian countries are not new, but have been ongoing since the 1980s. South Korea's investment focused on utilizing cheaper labor costs in Southeast Asia for export production, as well as using investment abroad as an effort to restructure Korea's domestic infrastructures. As a result, South Korea's federal direct investment brought more trade opportunities and further integration in the Southeast Asian region. Since 1991, South Korea has funneled the Korean International Cooperation Agency, also known as COICA, grants to fund nuclear development programs in Southeast Asia. And moreover, since 1987 onwards, the Economic Development Cooperation Fund, EDCF, through the Export-Import Bank of Korea has provided loans to Southeast Asian countries on de industry, industrial development and economic stability. Both programs under the Official Development Assistance, ODA, 
aimed at combating poverty, supporting sustainable development, and improving South Koreans' advancements in Southeast Asia. So between 1987 and 2006, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, became the largest region where Southeast, South Korea invested over US $1.13 billion. And furthermore, Korea, Korea has granted 24.2% of, of its grants, which amounts to $47 million to ASEAN members. This just shows that South Korea's efforts through COICA reveals a large share of its aids have been directed to ASEAN members as a high priority. The EDCF has provided significant loans to ASEAN members, which has amounted to 87 million. The countries are Indonesia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Philippines, Myanmar, and Laos. So through these development assistances, it is no coincidence that South Korea has played a prudent, strategic role in aiding nuclear programs in the region. Take, for example, Indonesia. Indonesia has expressed interest in developing extensive nuclear power structures because the demand for electricity has been growing so rapidly. And South Korea has helped help Indonesia achieve nuclear aspirations by providing COICA aid, EDCF loan, for the past 13 years, which has mounted through COICA, 22.1 million. And through these COICA grants, um, oops. Um, through these COICA grants, South Korea has marketed to the Philippines, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Thailand as well. In the Philippines, there has been some concerted effort between the Philippines and South Korea. However, the Philippines' corruption problem is so complex that it has yet to prove foreign investors and the international community that it, it can responsibly commit to a nuclear development process. Malaysia has operated a research reactor since the 1980s, and in the 90s, South, um, South Korea has helped facilitate that process. In contrast to the Philippines, Malaysia has regulated tough export control laws to prevent nuclear technology smuggling. Thailand has also faced the concern to diversify energy types and their sources. And their most prominent choice now is nuclear energy. Vietnam has also expressed strong interest in nuclear power to power its industrial growth. and has made great efforts to meet international initiatives and efforts of peaceful uses of nuclear energy and non-proliferation, <coughs> such as the Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism. And South Korea has provided quicker aids to Vietnam since 1992. And lastly, out of all the Southeast Asian countries, Burma. Burma lacks transparency in the technology and finance to develop nuclear weapons and capabilities. There have been also rumors that Burma has been receiving secret nuclear assistance from North Korea, which revealed a government construction of a secret nuclear reactor. And while all the attention is going towards Burma and North Korea, there's an unobserved interesting trend that South Korea has also been providing Quaker aids on nuclear power plants to Burma as well. South Korea has funneled aid to Burma since 90, 1992 and then in 2004, which has counted the most expensive amount. And there's no question that there might be a quiescence program between the two. It is obvious that South Korea has a strong influence in the region and its nuclear posture is pivotal to regional security. South Korea has set its sights on becoming a world player too aiming to export 80 nuclear reactors by 2030. Nevertheless, nuclear dangers pers persist in developing areas like Southeast Asia, which, God forbid, an accidental nuclear explosion can raise really grave security concerns. Seoul's growth as a nuclear exporter could be hindered by the fact that nuclear power is like no other industry because its material and technology can also be made used for the world's deadliest per we weapons and programs. Some countries like North Korea and Iran could or have used putative civilian technology to develop nuclear weapons. These are concerns because the technology is South Korea's key export market. And with Southeast Asia in its backyard, South Korea's nuclear technology have a prominent influence in shaping the sub-region's security environment. Overall, my research examines the nuclear development period in Southeast Asia and analyzes how South Korea's grants and loans can influence and shape their nuclear aspirations. 
ASEAN's efforts to uphold principles of international peace, security, and safety, and how the international community and institutions in place can, may respond to Southeast Asia's safest possible nuclear development in the 21st century. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about my research here. <clears throat> well, I want to thank um, KEI for the invitation to discuss uh, these papers. At least I think I want to thank uh, KEI uh, for this opportunity. Um, we have just heard uh, three papers that are uh, actually quite diverse in terms of their subject matter. Uh, I'm not sure I can claim to be uh, a real expert on any of uh, these topics. Uh, but um, uh, I think that what I can do is, um, you know, offer some suggestions on the papers, uh, maybe more from a, a, a layman's perspective and certainly not from an academic perspective, but, you know, from the perspective of, of a policy analyst. Um, because uh, what I found, uh, having had the opportunity to read uh, the three papers, uh, is that uh, all of them are quite data rich. Uh, they, a, as you can see from the presentations, uh, they're very well researched uh, and they um, um, uh, delve into uh, a set of uh, subjects that are very relevant to uh, South Korean policy and they try to put South Korean policy into a broader international context. Uh, in each case. Um, what I want to try to do uh, with each paper is to actually push the paper writers to be more uh, active in terms of developing their own conclusions and recommendations uh, based on the research that has been done. Uh, in each case, we have a very strong um, uh, case that has laid out that describes uh, what Korea's strategy has been in the respective area uh, and uh, tries to put it in some cases into a comparative context. Uh, but then I think the question, you know, since we're in Washington and since what I'm really trying to do is to bridge the academic policy gap, uh, you know, there's a, um, uh, a, a pretty good theoretical basis for the way that the questions have been framed. Um, when you come to Washington, basically everybody says, so what? What does it mean for us? What should we be doing? Uh, and um, the, the foundation is there, I think, in each of these cases uh, to be much more aggressive in terms of providing some, some recommendations. Uh, and so I want to uh, encourage all the papers, all writers to, uh, you know, think that through uh, as a way of trying to uh, help with that. Uh, I'll make comments on each of the papers, and I'll start with uh, June's paper on capital controls. Um, actually, this is a very interesting paper. It's uh, probably the one that I'm least qualified to comment on, uh, but it's really quite striking uh, in the presentation and in the paper how attitudes toward capital controls have shifted from the Asian financial crisis uh, to the global financial crisis. Um, and I think that what uh, June has done is to show that, you know, Korea has, you know, moved with the conventional wisdom uh, as it relates to capital co controls. First, in the Asian financial crisis, uh, well, you know, adopting the IMF prescription, not as though there was much choice in the matter, uh, but, uh, you know, um, uh, essentially uh, avoiding uh, capital controls, too, in the global financial crisis, uh, taking some steps in that direction, but doing it in a very cautious way to make sure that Korea is in the mainstream of the uh, evolving con conventional wisdom. Um, the question that I would have is, you know, based on, um, you know, the steps that she laid out in terms of what Korea has done so far, um, are they going to be effective? Uh, is it possible, is, uh, has Korea done enough uh, or are there some unanticipated vulnerabilities uh, that uh, might still be there? You know, this is a response to volatility, but, it, you know, um, 
the issues become very complex in terms of uh, downside risk, uh, possible costs uh, in terms of perceptions in the market uh, uh, as a result of taking these steps, you know, uh, versus uh, benefits. So that's one of the issues um, that I think uh, could potentially be explored. Um, Another thing that I think could have been useful in uh, informing the discussion on this paper, although I have to say that, you know, I make this set of comments fully aware that the job of the researcher is uh, challenging enough as it is, um, you know, but, uh, you know, one, some one question that, you know, uh, was kind of stuck in my mind was, well, since we've had this Asian financial crisis and global financial crisis experience, we also know that the IMF is changing its approach. Uh, and so what exactly were the lessons learned by the IMF? Uh, and what are the Korean perceptions of lessons learned from the Asian financial crisis to, th to the global financial crisis? Maybe a little bit of a, uh, you know, there's probably, you could probably write a much longer paper on that, but I think a, you know, some kind of summary description of how uh, views are developing on capital controls would be would be useful. Um, another thing I think makes uh, this paper particularly challenging is that it's clear that this issue of use of capital controls is occurring in the context of an evolution uh, in um, in the context or in global standard practice uh, away from the Washington consensus toward something else. Uh, and so I think that we need to try to get a handle on the context, or at least I needed a primer uh, on that uh, in order to really feel confident about, um, you know, understanding uh, why and how the Korean government has decided to uh, do what it has. Um, and then um, this is a small point, but uh, actually in the conclusion of the paper, there's a, uh, the, the paper comes back to looking at domestic issues related to the banking sector, but I'm not sure that that's really the focus of the paper. And so I would actually set that aside in favor of focusing on, uh, you know, the main, uh, the main bite of the apple, which is probably big enough. Um, Min Jung Lim's paper about energy competition in Northeast Asia, I have to confess that um, uh, this was a particularly challenging paper for me to comment on because um, uh, I had a kind of inherent bias uh, when I saw the topic of the paper, uh, and that was that um, a focus on Japan, South Korea by themselves without including China was simply not going to do it. Um, it seems to me that in light of especially recent trends with re regard to China, and uh, in fact those trends are illustrated in some of the graphs in her paper, we have to come to terms with what China's coal consumption means uh, as it relates to this, uh, you know, issue of uh, coal consumption in Northeast Asia. Uh, having said that, um, I did find, uh, and, and, and I think that the key issue there as it relates to China is even though Japan and South Korea are competing uh, against each other in the international market to secure coal, uh, they're competing on the basis of free market principles. But, you know, there's a perception that China is coming in as a mercantilistic competitor uh, and therefore is not playing by the same rules of the game. And so I think that that is an issue that one way or another, the paper has to come to terms with, uh, especially because once you get to the conclusion of the paper, uh, there are some recommendations that, that, that tie one to the need for that kind of, uh, you know, framing or analysis. Um, having said that, um, I think the paper shows very effectively that energy man's demand structures of South Korea and Japan as it relates to coal development are quite similar, uh, with Japan uh, being a little bit more advanced and therefore having some differentiated strategies, uh, especially as it relates, of, uh, it relates to clean coal technology. Um, another question that I think was raised by the last graph that she put up 
uh, that maybe reflects my personal interest, uh, but I think is fair to kind of put into the mix, is um, you know it turns out that the United States is one of the largest coal producers, and it just begs the question of, well, is there are there opportunities in terms of strengthening the U.S. South Korea and U.S. Japan relationships as it relates to coal? Honestly, I've never heard anybody talk about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it would be interesting to understand why. Certainly Australia seems to have a heightened profile as a result of its um, uh, uh, role as a supplier of coal uh, in, I think, uh, relations with bo both Japan and South Korea. Maybe there are price issues, maybe there's geographical issues, um, but I think it would be interesting to explore that. Um, uh, Another question that came up uh, for me when I was reading the paper is uh, the paper labels coal as a strategic sector. And I'm wondering, you know, if that label has a particular meaning as it relates to how Japan and South Korea respectively carry out their policies uh, as it relates to coal. Um, the I, I think that the part of the paper that is strongest and really could be developed further is really about uh, development of clean coal technology. Uh, and uh, Japan's and South Korea, it seems like they've adopted slightly different strategies because they have different levels uh, of capacity uh, in this area. Uh, but, you know, really I think the clean coal technology issue is the one uh, around which it might be most possible to imagine or envisage uh, s potentially structures for cooperation, uh, but there also could be some serious barriers in terms of competition because any time that you're talking about technology, uh, you're talking about uh, a desire to uh, uh, pursue self-development because obviously if you have the technology, you have the greater profit margin. Uh, and so this is, becomes a very interesting issue, I think, both in the context of Japan-Korea uh, and as it relates to uh, potential engagement with China. Uh, the paper talks a little bit about Japan-China engagement on uh, clean coal technology, but I think that that's also an area where it would be interesting to explore a little bit further uh, the uh, the cost benefits as it relates to um, uh, technology sharing, it's a business opportunity, but the more that you, sh the more you share the opportunity, the more that you're, uh, you know, possibly undermining profit margins uh, in that particular sector, even though there are broader benefits as it relates to um, technology diffusion and mitigation of emissions. And so, you know, that piece I thought, you know, could be very interesting uh, as, um, as, as a theme that could be further developed. Um, the, the, the conclusion of the paper, uh, you know, recommends uh, a coal and steel community, and it refers to Europe, uh, but, uh, you know, that was really the part that made me feel like, well, we've got to figure out how China fits uh, in this. Uh, if um, we're really going to be able to draw uh, those kinds of lessons um, uh, from Europe uh, for, for East Asia. Uh, and then the last paper, uh, actually very interesting paper um, that uh, explores South Korea's nuclear development assistance to Southeast Asia. Honestly, I had no idea that there was uh, as much uh, activity. Um, under COICA's auspices uh, connected to Southeast Asia. Uh, one part of the paper that I found uh, interesting uh, that Lisa didn't get a chance to talk about uh, was the origins of the Southeast Asian programs. Uh, and one reason why I thought, and, and, and you know, many of the Southeast Asian programs uh, really began as part of the Adams per for Peace program of the United States in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, the reason why I think that's notable is that that's precisely the way that the South Korean program started. And so it just kind of, you know, uh, raises an interesting question. What was it about um, South Korea's approach in this area that distinguished it from Southeast Asian circumstances? Maybe it's that Southeast Asia is a more energy-rich environment. Uh, 
the paper also talks a lot about the Southeast Asian nuclear weapons free zone and its ad adoption. Uh, I think an interesting question is whether the uh, the adoption of that nuclear weapons free zone could have had a kind of spillover effect in terms of public or leadership perceptions of nuclear uh, as an energy source. Maybe it made it harder for Southeast Asian leaders to think about bringing in nuclear. Um, um, you know, those are, um, that's a set of issues that I think could be, you know, um, interesting that the paper uh, touches on, um, frankly, as I think about it, they may also be tangents, but they were interesting uh, to me to consider. Um, another piece of the um, Korean nuclear cooperation um, uh, internationally that is not discussed in the paper that I think should be included uh, is related to uh, the activity of the Korea Institute for Nuclear Nonproliferation and Cooperation, KENAC. And the reason why that, uh, it's a relatively newer organization, uh, but, you know, that organization has been focused specifically on trying to promote, you know, do training uh, for nuclear uh, workers uh, and uh, has a mandate to, uh, you know, uh, address uh, uh, safety issues uh, as part of really uh, the broader strategy, I think. It, it's the non-proliferation component that makes the energy component of a strategy, I think, uh, more, uh, more viable, uh, at least from my perspective. Um, another question that I think is raised, is, well, that, that was raised in my mind by this paper, that it would be an area where uh, it would be interesting to see a policy conclusion is uh, whether or not uh, Korea's development assistance uh, in Southeast Asia uh, is going to be a source of leverage for South Korea in the context of the upcoming nuclear security summit. Are there things that Korea might be able to, uh, you know, understandings that Korea might be able to secure from Southeast Asian partners related to uh, nuclear security, you know, in the context of that upcoming summit? Um, Lisa touched on the North Korea uh, uh, Burma issue and uh, the fact that South Korea also uh, through COICA has been giving nuclear assistance and you know that obviously is <laughs> a very complicated issue that you could write a uh, completely uh, separate paper on uh, but I think that uh, you know it does you know raise this question as long as the North Korean nuclear issue is there um, it even if it doesn't have a, uh, a direct relationship to South Korea's nuclear energy, you know, export efforts, um, uh, there is a link in the minds of, of, of some, you know, to this unresolved peninsular question uh, related to North Korea's uh, nuclear uh, capability and how that's going to be resolved. Uh, and so that can be, uh, uh, like I said, it's not related, but uh, it can be an issue in the minds of some. Um, and then um, this also kind of goes beyond the scope of the paper, but, um, uh, you know, obviously given the events uh, in Japan with Fukushima, uh, we naturally think, well, does this nuclear renaissance have legs? Uh, and I think it would be interesting to try to take a little bit of a temperature in terms of, uh, I, and I know that this is a challenge of updating a paper. You, at some point you have to cut off, but, you know, uh, it would be interesting just to see whether that is having any impact on what uh, Quaker is, is thinking about or doing this year. And the last comment I would make on this paper, uh, and really my last comment, uh, is, um, um, you know, Quaker has made some, it looks like, based on this paper, some pretty significant investments uh, in uh, uh, nuclear development assistance in Southeast Asia. Uh, but so far, uh, it doesn't seem to me that there are any tangible returns in Southeast Asia. Um, and I think that uh, since uh, the UAE deal, you know, one of the areas that South Korea has found it very challenging to address uh, is uh, actually related to financing. So you've got this nuclear development assistance program, but you've got a financing cloud that makes it 
difficult to close deals or at least an area where other competitors like Japan may have a leg up, uh, for instance, in, in Vietnam. Uh, and so the issue of you know, uh, perceptions of return on investment and also the issue of how Korea is doing vis-a-vis -vis competitors uh, in light of the investment that it has made, I think, are areas that I would uh, want to see the paper focus on in terms of some sorts of uh, recommendations or conclusions. I'll stop there. I'm sorry I took uh, too long uh, with my comments. Thank you, Scott, for uh, such uh, uh, great feedback on, on all three of these papers. We want to open the floor and give uh, our audience the opportunity to ask questions. But before we do that, uh, I want to give our speakers maybe a, a couple of minutes just to, res if they have any response to what Scott had shared uh, with them. Uh, and I'll, I'll start off with June. Yeah, just go ahead and push, push the button. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for some of these recommendations given. I think I share the same kind of psychological burdens in trying to readdress these issues after I've written the uh, first draft. Um, all of these I, I more or less agree. And just on the first question, I think that writing a larger paper is also going to be helpful because it's going to be a part of my dissertation. Um, but addressing how effective it was is kind of difficult in terms of uh, the time lags because we've only implemented it just now. So <laughs> it's going to be a little bit difficult. But uh, when I try to publish it into a book, the dissertation into a book, I'll surely take this into consideration. Um, in terms of the lessons learned by Korea and the IMF, uh, I will also remember to take this into con consideration. And um, number three is I, I, I was quite unsure uh, about the a, a Primer needed to feel very confident about why and how the government has decided to do these um, things because uh, the decisions that were taken in the path of the development of capital controls um, were portrayed in the first and the second sections of the paper. But uh, if it hasn't been clear, then I will try to revise it a little bit and <laughs> make it a little bit more um, uh, succinct and clear. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, June. Uh, and Jim? Okay, thank you for your comments. And um, yes, uh, the main reason why I just compared Japan and Korea is actually compar comparative study between these two countries has been my, my own um, <coughs> particular um, in research interest. And one of this was uh, one of my um, main ongoing research projects. And the reason why I just uh, want to focus on the, these two countries are, as you mentioned, these two countries share the similar system and the free market system. Is comparing with the China would be a, a little bit different story from comparison between these two. So that is one of the biggest reason why I, I why um, I'm trying to focus on the comparison between these. Um, these two countries, but of course I, I cannot agree more. I mean, the, with your comment, I mean, the, we cannot um, get more more implications without the uh, Chinese um, Chinese vector. So definitely, I will try to I mean um, revise the uh, paper with your comments, and I, I want to add some <coughs> some recent trends of uh, Chinese uh, clinical technology or their issues <coughs> in the later <coughs> section of the paper, and. Um, Cooperate. I mean, and your common second comment is the uh, strategic sector uh, kind of stuff. Uh, so I I do 
Yeah, I do know. I mean, the technology issues is always sensitive. And even within the countries, they are competing to each other. I mean, for example, Tepco, they do develop, they does develop a CCD and other companies are developing. So they, sometimes they can uh, compete against each other even within the country. So it would be a little bit difficult I mean, to, to cooperate um, across the countries. But uh, still, I do, uh, as I mentioned in my conclusion, conclusion section, uh, I just would like to just suggest, I mean, uh, for the multilateral cooperation with the core and the core clean core technology, as you uh, agreed also, I mean, this theme is itself, I think, you know, is quite attractive um, theme, I think. <laughs> so, yes, uh, definitely, I will, yeah, I will try to revise the paper with your comments. Thank you for your comments. Great, thank you. Elisa? Yeah, I really appreciate your comments about my research. Um, can you please repeat to me the nonproliferation organization in Korea? You said Kin yeah, Kinak, K I N A C. Um, okay. Yeah, I will definitely incorporate that into my paper, as well as South Korea's ability to uphold IAEA standards as well, because I've found some really interesting information about South Korea in like the 90s upholding and you know those safeguards of nuclear energy as well <coughs> and definitely the nuclear renaissance period as, as, as you have mentioned um, it's really interesting how you know I didn't think of it how why South Korea has given so much COICA grants to Southeast Asia and yet it seems like you know, there's no renewable, I mean, Southeast Asia isn't going to give back in some way. So I'll look into that as, as well. So thank you for those comments. Great, thank you very much. Uh, now we're gonna open it up to the floor. Uh, please uh, raise your hand and state your name and your affiliation, and I will uh, recognize <laughs> you. And uh, we have a mic that's in the room. Please, in the back. My name is Yong Suang from South Korea. Kairi. Kairi is the National Laboratory for the Nuclear Energy. Uh, my first question is about the IGCC technology. You named that the typical clean coal technology. That might not be so true. Uh, I used to work for KTEP, which is the national body to develop the technology for the electricity for the from the coal for a long time. And the KTEP spent a huge amount of money for their version of a clean coal technology, which is quite different from your perception. In Korea, what they are trying to achieve for the throughout the clean coal technology are two things. How to reduce the burden of the fly ash. Uh, whenever you burn out the coal, you will end up with a huge amount of a fly ash. That's the biggest concern uh, for the clean coal technology. And the second uh, mission is how to reduce the sulfur uh, for the clean air. So those are the two key issues. And they spend uh, hundreds and billions of dollars per each year to solve that problem. So if you just name that the IGCC is the clean coal technology, key clean coal technology, then it's not the fact in South Korea. What they would like to really to do is to achieve two missions. So they might not so interested in IGCC technology at this moment, simply because most coal imported from the outside are from Australia. And Australia coal has uh, its unique uh, property. So what we deal is how to reduce the fly ash. And it's very challenging. So I personally recommend you to talk about somebody working on KTEP program, then you can find a whole variety of the clean coal technology. Then you might have uh, some different vision about Korea's approach. And also I used to work for the American clean coal technology when I was in graduate school, long, long time ago. And uh, <coughs> actually to me it's almost impossible to have a cooperation among Korea, Japan, and uh, China, and even in the United States because it's all commercial technology. So everybody would like to develop the patent. So especially throughout the cooperation, any kind of uh, multilateral cooperation, uh, it's you cannot get the patent 
without any legal problems. So basically, I do not believe throughout my experience that there will be no significant technical development cooperation between Korea and Japan, especially in the field of clean coal technology, at least for the time being. And uh, Scott mentioned what's happening in China. That's ana my another point. As I already mentioned, the Korean point of views are different from Japan. As I mentioned, our real burden is fly ash and the sulfur. China still <coughs> is the problem for the next generation. So if you would like to talk about the real cooperation, then you should talk about what's the real dilemma that each country is facing with at this moment. Without understanding that one, act actually, to talk about cooperation might not be so useful. And I'd like to mention something about the nuclear security issues, because I think that <laughs> I'm the one who can answer that one. Uh, Actually, China is just working for the safety, uh, security. We have another independent body for the nuclear safety, KINS. So both of them nowadays have a very strong tie with the South Asian countries. So if you just take a look at the COICA program that I used to work when I was in Korea, it's uh, just a small pie of the entire cooperation package. In addition, the US NNSA strongly sponsors the multilateral security problems in East Asia with the full association with the Korea and the Japan. So each year we have some serious working group meeting, including Thailand, Philippines, and other countries about nuclear security issues. So this year we'll have a meeting not in Southeast Asia, but in Jordan very soon. So. I know that there are the regular participants from Thailand, Indonesia on that meeting. Also, University of Tokyo, in association with Hewlett Packard and the other national foundation in this country, open a Southeast Asian nuclear security meetings almost four times a year. So. In order to talk about any kind of uh, nuclear security cooperation in Southeast Asia or East Asia, I think you should take a look at all those programs. Then you'll have different uh, ideas. In addition, the universities in South Korea actually are very active to educate the people from Southeast Asia and the Burma. So what we are trying to do is to spread the philosophy of the technology as well as the culture of the security. So I recommend you to take a look at all those programs if re you would like to really understand what's the real framework of the South Korea to help the nuclear program in Southeast Asia. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Huang. Uh, Stanley? <coughs> Stanley Kober, uh, since we're at a university group being alumnus of Georgetown. I'm no longer with Cato, it's misidentified. But when I was with Cato, my question is for Ms. Park. Um, I remember at a presentation once, speaker was complaining about the American trade deficit. This was, I guess, the second half, the second Clinton administration. We were running huge trade deficits. And I pointed out that the flip side of a current account deficit was a capital account surplus. And I asked, I told the speaker, in effect, what you're saying is investment in the United States costs American jobs. And he was taken aback by that approach to it. We talk about capital controls, um, the value of the currency. Everybody seems to want to have a lower value. Scott referred to China's mercantilist policy complaints about low valuation of the currency. But in the second half of the 90s, we had a very strong dollar and declining unemployment. It seems to me the more interesting question is what do you do with that capital? How do you achieve sustained high returns on invested capital? That was a very virtuous situation in, in the United States at the end of the 90s. It seems to me we're spending 
too much time looking at capital controls and not looking at how do we maintain high sustained return on invested capital. And so that's my question. Maybe we should refocus our attention. Great. Uh, would you like any of you to like to respond to uh, Stan's question or Dr. Huang's question or comments? June, you want to take it for staff? Oh, can I? I yeah, please. Not in the uh, order. Um, do I trust this again? No, no just okay. talk. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the comments. Um, actually, my dissertation topic is on American, U.S., Northeast Asia trade imbalance. And because um, I try to re link these uh, relationships between the accumulation of U.S. trade imbalance with within the trade with Northeast Asian trading partners. This is a very important point um, because capital controls itself is like a subsection inside um, the issue of trade deficits and the challenge from it. Um, I think your comments are very uh, enlightening in terms of uh, some of the aspects that I haven't been able to research on and I will take a look into the 1990s, the latter part of the 1990s a little bit more. Um, the only thing about um, capital controls per se, uh, trying to shed light on it and trying to see what kind of effects from capital controls we are witnessing, uh, the focus on this is more because uh, the general public in Korea are not really knowledgeable about these changes and for this paper per se, I wanted to kind of highlight that. Um, and in terms of trying to magnify the effect of investment uh, owing the, the, the investment that comes, derives as a capital inflow into the country. Some of the countries that have deployed capital controls are not super rich countries. I mean, Korea is a very highly industrialized country, but um, some of the countries that are surrounding the policy uh, spectrum in the G20, they are not actually, um, they were not actually for capital controls and up until late. So I thought um, re revisiting the issue would be very necessary, very, very much re necessary. And um, what do you do with that capital is, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a big question, but it, I don't think it can be addressed as a general perspective because we look at Japan and uh, there are so much in lack of foreign directive. Nobody wants to invest in <laughs> Japan and um, in, in Korea's case, it's a little bit different. It's more of a vibrant country, but uh, we will have to see how different it is in terms of country specificity and uh, how it is actually portrayed in every country. So I will take a look into this, but um, I'm not sure how we can <laughs> generalize. <laughs> But thank you very much. And Jenna or Lisa, would you like to? <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Hong. Oh, he left yeah. already. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, thank you for anyhow on his comment. I do know there are, as I mentioned, there are many different types of uh, clinical technologies and I just did not intend to uh, emphasize IGCC only, but there, um, he, as he mentioned, you know, carbon capture and storage technology also is a crucial factor. And but as far as I researched, you know, Korea also uh, in, invested to the uh, clinical technology, but the whole amount of the uh, money is quite low. I mean, the, compared to the Japan, because but as you know, I mean, the R and D uh, is closely related mm -hmm. to the amount of money itself. Uh, so, you know, Korea was just trying to efficiently use their um, their money, I mean, for CCT development. So car CCS, I mean, the clean carbon capture and storage technology was one of the uh, key factors. But the reason why I just uh, highlighted IGCC is, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, IGCC is um, for the electricity generation. So that is, uh, that is why I just thought um, this particular technology will be um, getting much more important, um, especially in the com competition uh, between the uh, um, South Korea and Japan and uh, China or and the United States also. And um, uh, yes, uh, and of course, um, 
as um, uh, Scott, Mr. Snyder said and um, Dr. Hong said, you know, uh, cooperation with the, uh, this kind of you know, technology issues will be will be quite difficult. I know that is the reality. We cannot, I mean, disagree. But um, again, I would like to just suggest, I mean, the, this uh, clinical technology can be a uh, uh, how can it can be a topic to make um, multilateral cooperation in this region? So I just hope I mean, this um, this particular topic can be a driving factor for the regional cooperation. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate Dr. Huang's comments <coughs> about understanding um, you know nuclear security cooperation in Southeast Asia as a whole, and not just look at you know that. Because he singled out the issue of um, not looking as broadly, but I should have mentioned in my speech, though, that my research did focus on ASEAN's, you know, security paradigms of like with Zafan. Zafan is the zone of peace and freedom and neutrality. How they had to uphold that during the 70s, as well as the SEANWFB, which is the Southeast Asian Nuclear Free Zone. Um, so I wish I could just that up to him as well. Thank you. Anyone else? Sure, I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, to June, um, uh, it, this is, goes in line with the kind of the so what question that Scott had mentioned, mm -hmm. which is um, at, at, up to the financial crisis, there has been all, a lot of talk in Seoul about making Seoul the next financial hub. And uh, looking to Singapore and other country, uh, excuse me, other uh, area cities like that to become um, a central place for a lot of investors to come. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering, from your perspective, uh, after all of these capital controls, one one question is: is what is you've talked about government attitudes? What is the private sector's attitudes of what mm -hmm. Korea has moved to do? And secondly, how does this impact? Uh, South Korea's future in becoming a financial hub, or are those dreams now uh, on hold? And um, just for Unjung's paper, really quickly, um, you in your paper, I had the privilege of reading your paper, and you had spoken a lot about <coughs> economic security dilemma, which you had not, you, you didn't even mention it in, in your presentation, and um, between uh, Korea and Japan. And um, I know what economic security, and this is. Uh, probably, uh, my, I'm not up to date with the, the literature, but w when you refer to Korea and Japan moving toward an economic security dilemma, I know what a, a military security di dilemma looks like, but what is, what do you mean by a Korea-Japan leading to an economic security dilemma? In the case of national security, that would potentially lead to war, right? But in the case of the, ec the economy, what, what do you see as the the worst case scenario in in what you're in terms of the <coughs> outcome of a, a economic security dilemma in the coal industry. So those two questions. Can I talk first? Yeah, go ahead. Um, thank you very much for this question. Um, in my understanding, I wasn't quite sure if the financial hub uh, discussion was still in place, but uh, to address this question. I, more or less, I understood Seoul as more of a um, trade hub. And financial hub in East Asia, for me, it was more of Tokyo and Hong Kong. And even Singapore, they dream of be become a fi becoming a financial hub. But I think right now their focus is more on becoming the education hub in East Asia. And uh, as far as private sectors are concerned, I think experiencing the Asian financial crisis enabled uh, gener the people in general and also the pri private sector people to become a little bit more sensitive about ownership per se because even Samsung shares are 50% owned by foreigners and in terms of implementing capital controls I think people are a little bit <coughs> conscious about who actually owns it and are they able to are they going to keep on sustaining uh, the value of the enterprises and also, this has nothing to do with nationalism, but I think there is a strong um, corporate uh, consensus on trying to protect uh, some of the technologies and softwares that are uh, developed in Korea. And capital controls 
may, we haven't seen the effectiveness of it yet, but it may be demonstrated in the, the performance of the private sector in the coming years. But in this paper, we took, we took a look at uh, banks, uh, the banking sector per se, and the government responses. Um, another thing that uh, could be linked to answering this question would be the prolonged exchange rate policy, which has been sustained by the Korean government for quite some time now during the Lee Myung-bak administration. And this enables competition uh, by far. I mean, um, when, I, when I flew here, Japanese yen was 70, 75, six per, uh, per one dollar, 75 yen per dollar, <laughs> which uh, gives a very strong compet competitive leverage to South Korean companies in terms of export. But um, implementing capital controls in line with the harsh exchange rate policy, criti criticized harshly by the IMF and the World Bank, South Korea and China's currencies are expected to be um, de devaluated. How, what's the word? Devaluated by 15% or so by these organizations. But is it going to go in tandem with the, the, the implementation of capital controls? This is a question I have uh, for my own research as well. And making Seoul the next financial hub uh, seems a little bit unlikely at this point for me. <laughs> thank you. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for your comment. And um, the concept of economic security dilemma uh, I was trying to say is related to the uh, energy uh, security trilemma, as I mentioned in the, my uh, presentation. Uh, both on the South Korea and Japanese economy, uh, we uh, do have to import um, the natural resources from abroad and we um, manufacture and then export the uh, goods. So this is how, how I mean, our economies, I mean, both countries' economies work. So we um, continuously need to import some natural resources from abroad. And uh, another factor is um, electricity generation, generation is, as almost, you know, other countries also has the same, same story, but electricity generation is the uh, key, I mean, major, concern um, of the, uh, these two countries. Uh, as you can see, I mean, after the Fukushima uh, Daiichi accidents, you know, the, the shortage of electricity uh, is um, really um, a, a burden, I mean, the, for the economic development or economic sustainability. So uh, to, um, to provide, to, to supply the, uh, enough electricity, um, so core, uh, actually core is the uh, largest, uh, largest resource uh, to support the uh, electricity generation in Korea. So it is larger than the nuclear, and it is, the, I, be, I remember its portion is almost like 30 or 40, between 30 and 40 percent uh, of electricity generation is um, made by core. So core is uh, quite really, um, I mean, important resource for both countries. And, but as I mentioned, you know, core is quite dirty. So clean core technology is, I do guess, I mean, getting much more important because uh, core, de uh, core demand, uh, I expect, will be uh, much higher even after the uh, this Fukushima situations. So, yeah, so what I want to um, uh, say with the economic security dilemma was, you know, this kind of things. You know, we have to um, make our economy grow further, but uh, we need to uh, diversify or stabilize our um, energy um, supply also at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking our speakers today, and we look forward to. Uh, uh, to fe other future contributions by these young scholars. And, and in November, we'll be uh, editing all of these papers and then binding them and creating a book out of this. So we, we will we look forward to, uh, uh, to distribute all the, the final versions of these papers to all of you then. Thank you very much.